So a very warm welcome to you all today to this, the second of this semester's colloquium. Uh, since 2016, uh, Professor Anne McClintock and I have been running the Environmental Humanities and Social Transformation Colloquium. Uh, and we wanted to thank at the outset the High Meadows Environmental Institute for the immense uh, support for the environmental humanities and for this colloquium in particular. So thank you to Director Gabe Vecchi, to Kathy Hackett, to Raj Shastri, to um, uh, Hans uh, Marcelino, to Morgan Kelly, and many others who have helped facilitate this uh, remarkable and important series. Um, we also wanted to thank our co-sponsors, uh, American Studies and um, Gender and Sexuality Studies. And just a couple of uh, small uh, administrative points. Uh, first of all, um, if possible, we would like you to keep your video on. Uh, that does create a warmer sense of community, particularly for the speaker um, at a time when many of us are community starved. Um, that said, we do realize that there are also many um, circumstances that require us to replace our best selves with a small rectangular black box. Um, so the other point is that uh, when we get to question time, we won't be using the chat. We will be using raised hands, be uh, physical or digital raised hands. Um, and the last point is I wanted to remind you that our third speaker in the semester series, uh, who's in attendance today, uh, is the eminent uh, Brazilian scholar, journalist, filmmaker, Felipe Melanes, and he will be talking on November 17th. So let's turn today to uh, our speaker, uh, Professor Kimberly Bain, and it's a very special joy to welcome uh, Professor Bain back to Princeton. She completed a PhD in the English department here, has many, many friends here, has been an inspiration to many here. Uh, after leaving Princeton, she assumed an assistant professorship at Tufts, and most recently has taken up a very exciting position at the University of British Columbia uh, in Vancouver. Uh, Professor Bain will be talking from her current book on black breath, uh, which traces a genealogy of breathing and blackness in the United States. So please join me in welcoming Professor Kimberly Bain. Thank you so much, Rob. Um, uh, the land from which I join you today is on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, the Squamish, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Musqueam nations, who have stewarded this land for hundreds of generations. And today, Vancouver is home to thousands of Indigenous people, and I am grateful to have the opportunity to live and work here. Yet the painful history of genocide and forced occupation of their territory remains unresolved. The repeated violations of sovereignty, territory, and water perpetrated by invaders that have impacted the original inhabitants of this land for hundreds of years demands reparations. The promise of justice does not need to come in a different time and place. It can begin here and now. Um, and so I want to um, say a couple of things. As you can probably tell, I'm speaking very quietly because I'm battling a very intense sinus uh, situation right now. Um, that's robbed me of my voice. And so if at any moment you can't hear me, um, I will try my best to speak louder, but unfortunately I can't speak much louder than this. Um, so please turn off your volume on your computer as best as you can. Um, and the other thing I'll say is that I'll confess that, you know, whenever I'm invited to give a talk, I'm usually quite overwhelmed with a sort of paralyzing duality of both intense gratitude and dread, right? Dread because, Every invitation comes with a request for an abstract. And at that point, I immediately flash to that sort of scene from SpongeBob, you know, the meme where um, he has to write an essay and instead of writing an essay, he does this really intensely and wonderfully detailed, detailed historiated initial of the word the, you know, it's just, there is the only thing you can write over hours of work. Um, and so whenever I, you know, submit an abstract, I'm always faced with the fact that the abstract I produce uh, promises so much. And then the actual talk may sometimes feel to meet those those you know promises and so I apologize in advance for any failures to meet them um, 
But the sort of second thing that I'm really faced with whenever I receive an invitation is, as I said, intense gratitude, right? Um, and that's the thing that sort of um, sits with me the longest and sits with me the strongest. It's a sort of sweet and a tangible gratitude uh, for being welcomed into a community to share my thoughts and to be in conversation with so many of you. Um, and sometimes, you know, the work that we do uh, can make us feel lonely and isolated. And so I always treasure those moments where we can be in genuine community with others. And so with the taste of sweetness in my tongue, on my tongue, I want to thank uh, Rob Nixon and Anne McClintock for the invitation and for their patience as we traded many an email back and forth over the last several weeks. Um, thank you so much, of course, to Laura Matecha and Raj Chakshi, who have done so much organizing behind the scenes and squaring away logistics. Thanks also to everyone that Rob and Anne noted at the start, um, many of whom I have not met and did not have direct contact with, but I'm sure uh, made this whole event possible. And also thank you to all of you for attending today, um, despite the fact that I think we're facing a sort of cumulative overload, whether it's physical, as in my case, you know, being ill, um, or emotional, professional, spiritual, um, metaphysical, you know, we're currently in retrograde right now. So for those of you who know what that means, you know, things are really in flux at the moment. So I appreciate you all coming out. Um, and the feeling is really doubly amplified today by seeing so many faces that I recognize, um, where I can, people who I consider interlocutors and people who I just really want to have something to offer to. So I know the EH Colloquium has always been a wonderful configuration of folks who are um, so very generous and so very gracious. And so I'm going to borrow some of that intellectual grace today um, to walk through in sort of bits and fragments uh, my current project, which, as Rob mentioned, is entitled On Black Breath. Um, and so what I'll be offering you all today is a sort of two part um, talk. The first part is going to be drawn from um, what I call interludes. And so the book project itself, um, between each chapter, I have creative interludes that are um, a combination of uh, collages, so visual collages, um, textual collages, um, playlists, um, sort of playing with the different kinds of textures of, and ways of attending to breath. And so what I'm going to do first is read a section from one of the more um, literary sections of these collages. I could put it up there, but I figured it would actually be easy if I read it in a more linear sense. So I'm going to read one of those interludes to open up, and then I'm going to pivot to um, a portion of the book, uh, which comes from the first chapter, um, which is around fugitivity and panting. So I will just get started. Um, first, I'm going to introduce everything, but okay. In a socio-political landscape that all too easily figures Black people as Black bodies, that is, things that are ever consumable, available, and fungible, the hardest task before Black people is to die only once. Despite George Floyd's murder having transpired over a year ago, his death at times feels as if it has reoccurred hundreds of thousands of times since. Indeed, his death, down to his final words, seems to have been prophesied six years prior by Eric Garner. I can't breathe. For many, Eric Garner's final words mark the social, political, economic, and environmental phenomena that gave rise to his premature loss of life. But in truth, even as breathlessness defined Garner's death, breathlessness first named a condition of his living. Garner, as we now know, struggled with severe asthma his entire life such that when the time came for his mother to memorialize his life, she would choose to line her living room memorial to her son with asthma inhalers. How do we, without reducing Garner's or Floyd's lives to their deaths and without rendering the particulars of their circumstances fungible, attend to the ways that breathlessness has been a defining character in the being of blackness. I speak here not just in moments of spectacular state sanctioned violence, but also and particularly in the slow, quiet, everyday lived experiences of black people. So often I find myself restlessly returning to the knowledge that Floyd had been hooping earlier in the day, hours before his murder, that Floyd was simply trying to buy a pack of cigarettes by what might have been a moment of solace and peace, trying to find a moment to breathe amid the devastating respiratory pandemic. I find myself restlessly returning to this fact because the truth is that 
In the midst of this pandemic, where it seems breathlessness is everywhere for everyone, I have been preoccupied by and with the way that some of us have been historically devalued, such that our lives are subordinated to state, federal, and corporate fiscal solvency, exposed to chronic and acute illness, disability, and death, and placed in intimate proximity to transmissive atmospheres that are toxic. All this while still facing the threat of spectacular state violence. And all this while the engines of racial capitalism and the grammars of modernity continue ever onward, ever dependent upon stealing value from blackness and suffocating that blackness, a metaphysical blackness, a collective one, an infrastructural one that seeks just a little bit of breathing room. Understanding how we arrived at Floyd or Garner or Eric Harris, Elijah McQueen, George Floyd, as I mentioned, Ella Kissy Deborah, Sandra Bland, Daniel Prude, and many more unknown and unnamed, demands a reckoning with Blackness' relation to breathing. It's a relation that is metaphoric and material and metaphysical at turns. It is also one shaped by the histories and futures of anti Black racial capitalism. My book is that story. Entitled On Black Breath, my book is a genealogy of blackness, breathing, and racial capitalism in the United States. In it, I piece together how breath and breathing become foundational to the history, theory, practice, and philosophy of blackness. More capaciously articulated, On Black Breath explores how mundane, ubiquitous, and everyday metabolic processes are made to participate as the material grounds for the development and maintenance of what Jody Melamed names white supremacist capitalist development, including slavery, colonialism, genocide, incarceration regimes, migrant exploitation, and contemporary racial warfare. When the norms, practices, and values that have shaped our contemporary moment simultaneously fashion and manage sociopolitical, environmental, biological, legal, and economic conceptions of breathing alongside its formation of blackness, then the dimensions, registers, and textures of the breathing apparatus, that is the lungs, the neck, the mouth, and the atmosphere, can theorize the entangled flows of race and capital. As I follow the logics of racial capitalism, which, as Sharice Britton Stelly articulates, seeks to position blackness within the structural relocation of being worthless, while containing surplus value essential to an array of socio-political and economic functions, including accumulation, debt, and as COVID-19 has showed us now, the absorption of the burdens of economic crises. And attention to Black breath as an analytic allows me to tarry with non-visual, ephemeral, and everyday economies of racialization. As such, the project has three aims. First, to trace the coterminous development of racial capitalism and its logics alongside the increased attention to the breathing apparatus. Second, to articulate how black breathing becomes imagined and narrativized as a need of management, surveillance, and extermination across the 19th century through the contemporary moment. And finally, to explore and sojourn with black cultural productions in the form of literature, film, music, and so forth that take up the urgency of Black breathing and their refusals of the anti-Black racial capitalist logics of the world. By focusing on breath, I explore an overarching question that drives my intellectual preoccupations, which is how racial capitalism and racialization come into formation, how they shape our values and become mundane, and the material effects and afterlives of their social operation. My preoccupations center themselves on these social grammars, not only for the problem they pose, but because they offer us a way of doing critical inquiry. To this end, the project, apologize for my cat, um, theorizes breathing across the 18th century to the contemporary moment through transdisciplinary approaches, which are evident in the intellectual promiscuity of my archives, some of which you'll be caring about as I read my um, talk today. Through breath, which is materially, materially tied to the body, yet operates as a metaphoric and sociopolitical phenomenon, I consider how the mundane and invisible phenomenon of the, of the body are managed and exploited. And I contend with the way Black cultural productions have covertly and explicitly grappled with breath as a model for knowing oneself, building community, affecting resistance, and 
producing creative expression. I interrogate Black breathing from its totalities to its particulars, to its particulate matter, to its genetic matter across five chapters in a series of interludes. Um, and so I don't really, I won't really go into depth about what each of the chapters are, but briefly put um, the sort of first chapter that I cover um, called Parent, which I'll be giving a little bit of an excerpt of today, um, tends to um, race science of the 19th century, um, thinks through legal conceptions of air and breathing and fugitivity. Um, the sort of second chapter, which is cough, thinks through um, speculative finance, so traces sort of a genealogy from Zong and its um, reliance upon speculative finance to the contemporary moment and how we imagine the futures of capitalism. Um, choke is a chapter that's going to uh, focus on uh, infrastructures of suffocation. So it looks to Louisiana's cancer rally, it looks to the Hawks Nest disaster, um, as well as moments of protest. So um, we can think of even the recent protests this past summer um, around George Floyd and how tear gas is deployed. And so it's thinking through speculative geographies um, or infrastructures of suffocation. Um, chapter four, which is GASP, uh, thinks through sort of ecstatic breathlessness. So how do black creatives um, and black activists and artists take up breathlessness, not solely as a sort of space of, of death and dying, but actually something that can provide a different form of living and being. And then the final chapter on Psy, thinks through exhaustion, um, specifically black women's political exhaustion. Um, and in between each of these chapters, I have an interlude um, that addresses different themes, uh, brings in different uh, texts and um, textures. Um, and you'll be hearing a little bit of one of them. So as I said earlier, um, the section I'll be sharing with you comes from later on, the interlude that I'm sharing with you comes from later on in the book project. Um, it's near the end, it comes um, between Gasp and Psy. Uh, and then I'll be reading an excerpt from chapter one, Parent, um, which again, as I said, discusses uh, conventions of race science and legal uh, conceptions of breath and breathing. And I thought, you know, as a quick aside, I thought, I would focus on that today um, because I've been trying to work through genuinely right now uh, the sort of um, ways that I want to tie the different chapters together in the book, right? So how do I tie the ends to the beginnings? And so that's why I'm offering you a piece near the end and offering you a piece near the beginning to sort of think through this, but I'm also happy to talk about any of the additional chapters in the Q&A afterward. Um, so let's begin again. Mm -hmm. Like every other problem that leaves me in my bed sweating and groaning and tense from the oversaturation of archive and memory, two wheels, one turning clockwise, the other counterclockwise, the quandary before me grows bigger in the dark. The dark hair feels like flesh pressed too tightly together. It smells like improvident avarice. Restless, I turn over and turn to Horton Spillers. Quote, those African persons in Middle Passage were literally suspended in the oceanic. If we think of the latter in its Freudian orientation as an analogy for undifferentiated identity, removed from the indigenous land and culture, and not yet American either, these captive persons, without names that their captors would recognize, were in movement across the Atlantic, but they were also nowhere at all. Inasmuch as, on any given day, we might imagine the captive personality did not know where she, he was. We could say that they were the culture, they were culturally unmade, thrown in the midst of a figurative darkness that exposed their destinies to an unknown course. Often enough for the captains of these galleys, navigational science of the day was not sufficient to guarantee the intended destination. We might say that the slave ship its crew and its human as cargo stand for a wild and unclaimed richness of possibility that is not interrupted, not counted, accounted, or differentiated until its movement gains the land thousands of miles away from the point of departure. How did we get here thousands of miles away from the point of departure? The ships that sail from the coasts of Africa to the Americas and the Caribbean, carrying black flesh for sale and plunder, could not rely solely on the signs of navigation to get where their markets were. As black flesh sat suspended beneath the waves of the oceanic, the slave ship and its crew were led by the whims of the oceanic gyros across the Atlantic. These gyros, 
massive oceanic circulatory systems made of strong currents and formidable winds, churned the waves and pushed the sails of the ships towards the so-called new world. And so in this sort of interlude, I um, point to these gyres, because as you can see, when uh, the slave ships would be traveling between the coast of Africa to the new world, they would be reliant upon these sort of wave patterns um, and also wind patterns to get them where they needed to go. What did Brathwaite write? Wasn't it that, quote, even before the first slaves came, there was a wind, an implacable climatic, indeed geologic connection? The North Atlantic and the South Atlantic gyre, yes, the strong winds that blow across the ocean and shape its path, were simply doing the thing they'd been doing for centuries before. Whether it ultimately aided those ships or hindered them with powerful storms that swept them to the bottom of the ocean feels beside the point when groaning and sweating in the dark. Slave ships needed the wind to carry the stench of their avarice to the new world. They also needed the means to decrease the mortality of their living cargo. To do so, they built large hatches covered with lattice into ships. The plans of slavers, and this is a quote, shows two types of hatchways, large ones, which offered more air to the slaves and probably increased their survival rate, and small ones, which protected the vessel from waves, from the waves entering the hull and increased the control of slaves by limiting their movement from hull to deck. Thus, a simple thing like the size of hatchways reflected whether the ship's owner gave higher priority to the health requirements of the slaves or the survival of the vessel, end quote. The ship and its crew knew enough about the science of living cargo to know the air, what little of it they deigned to allow to penetrate the hold, would carry their cargo just a little bit further. The same sails, billowing with the wind, pushed that same wind back below the deck into the hold where it did little to disturb the horror of the dark. Here in that dark, wind and air were a blessing, which is to say akin to a vexation and Equiano choked on it. Quote, the stench of the hold while we were on the coast was so intolerably loathsome that it was dangerous to remain there for any time. And some of us had been permitted to stay on the deck for fresh air. But now that the ship's cargo was confined together, it became absolutely pestilential. The closeness of the place and the heat of the climate added to the number in the ship which was so crowded that each had scarcely room to turn himself, almost suffocated us. This produced copious perspiration so that the air became unfit for respiration from a variety of loathsome smells that brought on a sickness among the slaves of which many died, thus falling victims to the improvident avarice, as I call it, of their purchasers. This wretched situation was again aggravated by the galling of the chains, now become unsupportable. And the, filthy, and the filth of the necessary tubs into which the children often fell and were almost suffocated. The shrieks of the women and the groans of the dying rendered the whole scene of horror almost inconceivable. Many a time we were near suffocation from the want of fresh air, which we were often without for whole days together. This and the stench of the necessary tubs carried off many. I find myself asking here, how did anyone find themselves here? How did we find ourselves out of the oceanic? Could we have even come to be? If domination requires continuous renewal, the mundane and autonomous functions of the black body stand as especially fertile grounds for implementing and sedimenting oppression, especially given that blackness never completely escapes the body because to quote Kara Keeling, how we matter to and in this world is the body. In the search for a suitable candidate to not only continually attach domination and oppression to blackness, but ensure the flourishing of the logics of modernity and racial capitalism, breathing and its apparatus, the atmosphere, the nose, the mouth, the lungs, the neck, emerge as a particularly fecund site. Perhaps what I am trying to tarry with today 
are the scalar aspects of breathing in an anti-Black environment. Environments here are constructed from the slave ship built to transport more Black flesh across the Atlantic to perhaps legal environments, such as the case like Somerset versus Stewart, argued in the courts in 1772 to determine whether or not one who was marked socially dead could in fact claim their own body, to the ecologies of the plantation, to even the environment of the urban city where we lost Floyd. The material, metaphorical, and man-made matter of wind, air, and breathing was a tool and technology and has been a tool and technology by which, to quote Jacqueline Goldsby, quote, to coerce, to not rough-handedly correct, to deny, not merely restrict, and to subjugate, not only banish or dispatch Black people, depriving them of the political, economic, social, and cultural opportunities that they need. Yet its presence was also a site of burying the seeds of fugitive impulse. And that is what I wanna talk about today. And perhaps what I've been trying to talk about for many years. How do we attend at the end of the day to this duality? Both of the violence that seems to happen between the silences of our words and also the ways that we dream and desire and enact fugitivity, whether it be on the plantation or whether it be in our everyday lives, in our jobs, etc. Historically, this fascination with lungs and air influenced many folks of the 19th century, especially professor and medical doctor Samuel Cartwright. Cartwright, a Southern man of letters and an ardent lover of Thomas Jefferson's work, understood that Mason -Dixon, the Mason-Dixon line proved to be a particular irritation. Um, and so the reason why uh, Thomas Jefferson is really important here is because Jefferson's note on the state of Virginia, um, he has a section under the category of the laws of Virginia where he discusses um, the black body essentially. And in that section, he has a long extended deliberation on black lungs um, and basically compares black lungs to that of an animal lung. Um, and so Cartwright himself is sort of leaning upon Thomas Jefferson's genealogy and in fact cites him very often. I don't really go into depth here about that, but that's just sort of a side note that's important to know. Um, as he would complain in his renowned text, quote, the diseases and peculiarities of the Negro race, the Mason-Dixon line was a, quote, mere airline without wall or guard that did remarkably little to stop enslaved persons from absconding across the border. Indeed, in his mind's eye, its ephemeral quality seemed all the more enticing to the enslaved and all the more aggravating for the well-meaning slaveholders of the South. As a young child in Virginia and later as a medical student in Maryland, Cartwright had witnessed the transformative power of, quote, mere air. Once across, fugitives could find sanctuary from the full force of the law and the full brunt of being marked as property. Mayor Eyre demarcated a starting point for Black freedom, though it, like many borders, marked not the distance between the sides, but instead their faults and constructed division. So yes, Cartwright understood the trouble with breath indeed, and that Mayor Eyre line haunted his work in journals and magazines. Fugitivity was an untenable outcome for the Southern doctor and the readership of his journals in which he most commonly published his work. After all, the question of black fugitivity had rightly frustrated slavery advocate, advocates um, as anything approaching a science of fugitivity was not only difficult to ascertain, but improbable, precisely because at its core, it practiced escape, dissemblance, opacity, obfuscation and misdirection. Together, the arrangements of fugitivity produced a genre of being, a chthonic form of politics that viewed questions of enslavement and freedom slightly askance. After all, fugitivity occurred across a variety of performances, metaphysical, imaginative, philosophical ones, as well as acts like visiting lovers without permission, breaking tools, conspiring to rebel, absconding with oneself or one's, one, one's loved one. We can even imagine today how fugitivity plays out. The attempt to find a place to buy a pack of cigarettes to get some breathing room in the midst of a pandemic, or even sitting in one's car, smoking a cigarette, pulled over ostensibly for failing to signal, and then ending up 
founding hung in your jail cell. Fugitive slaves who managed to breathe the free air of the North did not in fact become legally free, as we all know. As Lewis Garage uh, Clark noticed of his escape from Kentucky across the Ohio River and onto the quote, free soil of Ohio, um, the spirit of slaveholding was not all south of the Ohio River. In fact, as he says, quote, there was no free state in America. All were slave states bound to slavery and the slave could have no asylum in them. And so when fugitivity posed such a massive issue and problem, what slaveholders sought to manage were the impulses, the fugitive impulses before they occurred. Of course, the trouble with fugitivity was its potential character. Action potential mattered as much as the active enactment. And the potential character of fugitivity was marked most carefully by slave owners who would whip just as soon as the thought entered the mind. Whipping was decidedly a preventive measure against absconding or other bad conduct. In his role then, as the director of the Medical Association of Louisiana, Cartwright tasked himself with asserting why, ascertaining why enslaved persons turned fugitive. Only a year after the passing of the revived Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, Cartwright would posit the, the cause and cure of fugitivity in a journal called the Bowes Record. And in a seminal piece, quote, Diseases and Peculiarities of the Negro Race, he would develop a theory to provide a biological and psychoanalytic reading of the fugitive. The two diseases he created were twofold. The first was drapetomania, or a disease causing Negroes to run away. Um, and many of us will sort of recognize that um, sort of in its popular um, understanding of it, it sort of has a, a sort of larger life. But the second disease that he produces in this text, you know, a dual disease that he produces is called the cestasia ethiopica, or the hebetude of the mind and obtuse sensibility of body, a disease peculiar to Negroes called by overseers rascality. That's the full name, by the way. Um, he was quite in love with long names. But what happens when we sort of think about this sort of latter report in relation to fugitivity is what I try to parse out in this opening sort of gambit of this chapter, right? So if dreptomania was the actual act of absconding, then the cestasia ethiopica marked the kernel of fugitive impulse, fugitive potential. Right? So the cestasia ethiopica or rascality operated as, kind of, as a kind of precursor to dreptomania, a sign of worse things yet to come, a sign of potential flight. And rascality was reflected, uh, rascality reflected an attitude of resentment and resistance to the demands of labor on the enslaved, which bubbled over into fantasies of freedom. As he noted of the Cestasia Ethiopica, quote, the disease is a natural offspring of Negro liberty. It is much more prevalent among free Negroes living in clusters by themselves than among slaves on our plantations and attacks only such slaves as live like free Negroes. And so here what we see happening is that he is um, highlighting the way that not only is um, this a disease, quote unquote, that affects folks who are sort of Free, oriented towards freedom, or oriented towards fugitivity, but he's also marking the way that it's um, slightly contagious, right? So it's prevalent among those who live together in clusters and then attacks, sort of language of attacking those who um, take on air, as you can say, of living like a free person, right? So in his mind, black political subjectivity and black freedom were diseases in need of curing as it ruined the labor potential of black persons who instead would break, waste, and destroy everything they handled. Furthermore, the disease intensified in the presence of the wrong kind of air. So this continues his description of the cessation of Ethiopica. And he writes, um, contrary to the received opinion, a Northern climate is most favorable to the intellectual development of Negroes. A Northern climate remedies in a considerable degree, the naturally indolent disposition, but the dense atmosphere of Boston or Canada can scarcely produce sufficient hematosis and vigor of the mind to use them to labor. To be clear, the Northern climate that Cartwright is referring to here is the Northern climate of slave states, right? So he's referring to slave states like Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, Virginia, um, sort of North and the South, right? Um, and when he speaks of states and nations across Mason Dixon line, he speaks of the air being unable to penetrate black lungs sufficiently so as to activate black vigor, um, which is to say the ability to labor, 
And so for Cartwright and for his readers, um, the lungs are emerging as a site of Black fugitive impulse, precisely because Black lungs are unable to properly metabolize the air necessar necessary for them to emerge into the realm of the full, fully human. So I don't include this quote here because it's a very, very long quote, but essentially one of the things that he later argues is that um, Black folks who, um, particularly enslaved Black folks, um, have a similar breathing pattern, have a similar kind of breathing um, circulation as babies do, um, particularly white babies, right? So he's sort of doing a double work in his articulation of how air um, and climate and atmosphere affects Black lungs by one, as I said earlier, articulating the way that, well, without the right kind of air, you can't labor correctly, but also to sort of turning to a paternalistic um, view of that air and labor and seeing that how well, um, in fact, the reason why they need to breathe a certain kind of air, not the air of the quote unquote North, but in fact, the air of Northern climates in the South, um, is precisely because if they're not able to do that, they can never fully rise into the realm of the human. Not that he believed that they were human anyway, but um, it was an argument that he made for the sake of abolitionists at the time. He said, you know, well, if you really want uh, black folks to be considered human, you should really consider the fact that, well, they can't really breathe like um, adults, full adults who are, you know, political subjects um, who are able to um, be self-sovereign. In fact, they're like children. And so therefore we have to treat them as such. So, um, Cartwright's qualm was that too high a degree of improper breathing resulted in rascality, which could then turn, in turn ripen into absconding into the night. In any case, Cartwright's race science, along with others of his time, helped to naturalize the argument that instinct and the very deepest nature of the Black person did not want, nor need, nor pant after freedom in the slightest. Enslaved persons must prevent free air from entering the lungs, in fact, and vivifying her. Full and free respiration, in fact, was hurtful to the enslaved person. Breathing as they desired would lead to the enslaved taking on airs that ultimately led to rascality and free-minded thoughts and actions. And so now I'm gonna to pivot to a later section in this chapter, um, thinking about a little bit more about the black perspective on breathing and air, um, particularly through slave narratives um, and how panting sort of figures into that. What loopholes that black lungs find? Loopholes that help them find fugitive breathing room. There was of course the legal loopholes that reverberated across the Atlantic. As I mentioned earlier, the legal case Somerset versus Stewart, uh, or simply called, quote, the Negro case, was a legal battle that would become famous within its time and thereafter for its defense of an enslaved black man by the name Somerset on the grounds of a metaphor that bestowed upon England, not Somerset importantly, the boon of free air. The case established one of the first instances in which the metaphor of breathing free air became precisely the grounds for imagining how metaphors of freedom and fugitivity might be written upon and within the everyday functions of the black body. It established breathing as a non-peripheral concern for the slave economy. Breathing the quote, right kind of air, breathing quote, pure air could intervene into processes of racial capital taking an individual rendered legal property, rendered socially dead, rend rendered as chattel, and imbuing them with rights and legal freedoms. It could reanimate those previously marked as socially dead. In this way, it was here where breathing began to most loudly shape the conceptions of freedom and, freedom and enslavement and fugitivity. I'm happy to talk more about this case in um, the Q&A if you have more questions about it. But the point here that I'm trying to mark with this particular case is that belief in the transformative power of breathing free air, or in some cases simply breathing, was not a metaphor without teeth for fugitives who wrote of the attempted and sometimes successful escapes of enslaved persons from the plantation. Quote, every day for a fortnight, Harriet Jacobs writes in her incidents in the life of a slave girl, if I looked out, I saw horsemen with some poor panting Negro tied to their saddles and compelled by the lash to keep up with their speed till they arrived in the jail yard. Henry Box Brown, who was at a Christmas choir concert during the year 1848, was profoundly struck by the lyrics and public performance of the Alexander Pope song, Vital Spark of Heavenly Flame, and noted that it was in that moment that began to chafe against the chains of enslavement, quote, I now began to get weary of my bonds and earnestly panted after liberty. Frederick Douglass too, had something to say of panting in my bondage and my freedom, quote, 
I nevertheless looked forward to an escape to the North as a possible means of gaining liberty for which my heart panted. What seems like a rhetorical flourish in the slave narrative, a genre at times dismissed for sentimentalism, in truth marks a burgeoning theory of how unshaping the ontologies of unfreedom can find strength in and might be represented by specific phenomenologies of breathing. Despite the popular abolitionist imaginary that once a fugitive arrived on free soil, they were in some manner free, the question of freedom for many enslaved Black persons was far thornier than simply arriving in the North. And though the free air metaphor aligned closely with that of the free soil rhetoric of the period, the turn by both Black writers and pro slavery race science of the time to questions of the respiratory apparatus specifically as they related to the questions of emancipation and fugitivity, becomes particularly re relevant to the longer histories of how Black breath becomes a site of violent management. And so um, part of a section that I cut out of here is around um, the murder of Eric Harris, who I mentioned at the very start of this. Um, and one of the things that I walk us through here is that one of the things that occurs at, Her at Eric Harris's uh, murder is that uh, as he's yelling that he can't breathe, um, the police officer that is holding him in place um, yells, fuck your breath, right? And so I trace out how that kind of attention actually that is part of this whole structure is actually subconsciously and now consciously known um, within state actors in many ways, right? So there's a way that um, Black breath is a site of violent management and it's known to be one even in moments where um, uh, it seems to be a sort of subliminal um, instance in, in what's happening, right? Because of course, Eric Harris has been shot. So the thought is that how well the violence is in fact around him being shot. But in fact, what I'm trying to mark out is the way that the use around being able to breathe or fucking someone's breath um, is in fact pointing to a certain kind of violence that's happening on a metaphysical level, right? Um, after all, just as the metaphor of free air and breathing free air begins to disappear from literature, the implicit connection between liberty, free, and air, that is the ability to breathe it, morphed and persisted in other ways. If air was to be implicitly considered freedom granting in the social imaginary, then is it any wonder that the image of racialized lungs not being fit for free air morphed such that it became sublimated into the most violent practices found in the aftermath of the Civil War? Is it any wonder that lynching demanded not only violent brutalization of bodies hung up on the neck, for all to see. Harriet Jacobs or Linda Brent's loophole of retreat is where I want to end. Harriet Jacobs' incidents in the life of a slave girl details the horror of enslavement experienced by a young woman growing up on a plantation, caught between the lascivious desires of her master and the jealousy of her mistress. Jacobs catches the eye of her owner and finds herself relentlessly pursued by him. In an effort to escape him and gain freedom for herself and her children, Jacobs finds herself forced between, to choose between limited options within a world with limited compassion for an enslaved black woman. And through various machinations, including giving birth to children from another white man and hiding away in the crawl space of her grandmother's home for seven years, she's eventually able to gain freedom for herself and her children in the North. And the loophole that I mentioned here and that titles this last section, um, is her loophole of retreat, the garret above her grandmother's home, a space that slips between being a sweat box, a freezing coffin, and an echo of the cabin that Dr. Flint threatens to exile her and her children to so that he can continuously rape her for years. But it is also a site that is filled in many instances with only breath. As Jacobs describes in her narrative, I suffered for air even more than mind. She was restless for want of air. She was quote, longing to draw in plentiful draughts of air and was stuck in an atmosphere, quote, so stifled that even mosquitoes could not then to, could, would not con condescend to buzz in it. Jacobs writes about struggling to breathe for seven years that she must hide, unable to move her body, unable to see very much, except in the small moments in which her loophole offered her light down onto her children's vis visage. Yet in Jacob's case, the co-optation of practices of suppression of breath is what allows her to avoid detection and enact fugitivity without ever leaving the plantation and eventually make her escape. What Jacobs does in that moment in those seven years of hiding in the garret, of hiding in the loophole, 
is alchemizes the suppressed breath and suffocated breathing that she had seen others experience and that she prophesied many others would experience into a contemporary moment. She suppresses her breath voluntarily so as to mask her presence and bide her time before she could escape to the North. A suppression of her own breath was, that was parcel, part and parcel of the fugitive motion that was that she, oh, a suppression of her own breath that was part and parcel of the fugitive motion that she undertook, a fugitive motion that was her being stuck in place. And so her suffocated breathing points to modes of breathing that again, orients us to what an outside of all of this, right? Even as we are stuck in these moments of anti-Black violence, even as we are marked as systems or marked as bodies that are within a system of capital that devalues us while still producing capital off of our bodies, she and we are able to turn to other options in these moments. After all, when running is no longer an option as it was for her and as it is for some of us, all she and we can do in the end is breathe. Thank you. Mm -hmm. well, um, it, just in case, I didn't show you this, but this is um, a uh, screenshot of the case of Somerset uh, versus um, Stewart and that's it. Anyway, thank you. All done. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you so much for that powerful talk, um, Kim. And uh, if any of you have questions, um, please just uh, raise your hand uh, physically or digitally. And uh, I'm sure Kim will be happy, happy to engage. Well, perhaps I'll just jump in there, uh, uh, Kim. And and there's there's so many powerful scenes and so many powerful uh, figures of speech in your writing. Um, and I was thinking of of a word that you used when you're talking about Harriet Jacobs, which is uh, alchemize. And the alchemy of threatened breath. The exhalation, the, the say the panting, and and song, especially the, the 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 profound cultural traditions that um, that I know you you write about as well, um, that express creatively um, this double relationship, this duality that you talk about in relation to breath, and so. I wondered if you might uh, say a few words about mm -hmm. that. Yeah, um, that's really excellent. So the alchemy thing um, is um, definitely lifting from and inspired by a quote that Nate Mackey um, has in one of his short essays, I think, on, on precarity um, and breathing. And he writes essentially that the transmutation or the alchemization of anti-Black violence is one of the uh, core jobs or one of the core callings of um, Black creative cultural expression, right? Um, and I've always taken that line very seriously because I think he's actually pointing to something that's really important, right? Like even in moments in which um, Black folk are stuck within these systems of violence, um, the way that we're orienting ourselves and not always toward that violence, right? There's a way that life persists in other ways, um, despite the fact that we're in an anti-Black world. And so uh, Jacob's ability to alchemize that sort of space of the garret, right? Which um, for those of you who may not have read the, the narrative itself, um, the garret is this very small crawl space above her grandmother's um, home. Um, it's, by nine, it's basically nine feet by um, three feet tall, I think by seven feet deep, essentially. So it's not very tall, it's not long enough or tall enough to stand in or to do very much except lay there, right? And she um, basically interns herself there for seven years as a way to escape her um, owner, precisely because he wants to continuously uh, sexually assault and rape her, et cetera. And so that's her way of en enacting fugitivity. And, you know, the scene with Jacobs, I always think of in relation to sort of more, uh, maybe not more famous, but 
um, a sort of equally uh, well-known scene of another black enslaved woman and how she um, is um, made to interact with the sort of um, system of enslavement. And that scene is on Hester's scream um, at the sort of start of Frederick Douglass's narrative, right? So um, Frederick Douglass, um, he has two sort of versions of his narrative. Um, and in both of them, he sort of opens up with this uh, moment where he talks about, you know, I'm living my life, I'm having this sort of idyllic childhood. And then um, at this sort of moment, this sort of scene of subjection where I, where I erupt into realizing just how bad slavery is, not just how bad slavery is, that's a, maybe a, a flippant way of saying it, but the sort of moment in which he realizes that, you know, not only is slavery um, a sort of um, space of absolute ontological violence, right? Um, but in fact, he sees its effects is, He's um, standing um, near the sort of shed and he's hearing his aunt being beaten um, and she's screaming the entire time, right? Um, and so he writes about how Aunt Hester, that's what he calls her, her shrieks or her screams um, penetrate his sort of consciousness and like sort of sit with him for many, many years afterwards. And that's sort of a, a really well-written about sort of scene in which a black woman is um, faced with the sort of violence of enslavement. Um, and I think about that in relation to your question on music precisely because as we're thinking, or as I'm thinking about um, the way that not just black music develop, but develops, but specific, specific traditions develop um, in relation to the question of shrieking, in relation to the question of um, Jacob's rights, how all she could do sometimes was lay there and moan in her garage, right? So shrieking and moaning, I think come out in, in particular, um, the sort of generic form of R&B, um, which is sort of, you know, um, oftentimes attributed to being a very black femme uh, creative process, right? Especially around music, et cetera. Um, but I think of it as actually hearkening to or alchemizing the kind of violence, historical violences that we see happening to Aunt Hester and we see happening to Harriet Jacobs, precisely because um, there's a way that moaning and shrieking in R&B actually is turning moaning, the act of moaning and the act of shrieking away from the sort of um, intense violence that we see happening to their bodies to what's sort of more ecstatic um, eruption of uh, articulating what moaning and screaming can do, right? So, um, I mean, there's so many songs that we can think about. Um, also, we can think about how, you know, Black men take up R&B in, in their songs, but um, I mean, Janet Jackson, a lot of her music, you'll have moaning at the very various points. So even um, if you listen to Missy Elliott, some of, even though she's sort of more articulated as a rap artist, which I think Missy Elliott sort of traverses many genres, um, you'll hear moaning in the sort of backtracking of her songs, right? And so there's a way that moaning and even shrieking, like, ah, oh, like those kinds of noises actually become rearticulated towards a sort of, um, not um, purely pleasurable politics, but in fact, rearticulated towards a certain um, understanding of the self and the body and um, how we can move under a constraint um, that I think is really um, speaking to the fugitive impulse that we find in Jacobs, for example, right? Um, so that's just a, a sort of taste on what you're talking about around music, but um, yeah, it's such a great, um, wonderful question. So thank you. Great, thank you, Kim. Anybody? Uh, uh, Jeff, thank you. Hi, Kim. I was going to take a little long to think this this through. It feels like a sort of inchoate thought, but it's such a provocative paper and uh, and and uh, and often you know harrowing and kind of phenomenologically harrowing. You can kind of you can feel it, mm -hmm. as you hear it. Um, and I, I, and it made me aware of my breathing as I was sitting here. Um, and the um, the sort of funny st status of just breathing with respect to the the will and to freedom and and those categories it must be pretty important to how we can begin to understand them um, and I just wonder in relation to gasping and panting especially sort of what what that phenomenology has has meant to you the fact that you can let you can let go of your the, the 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 freest breathing is unfelt is that right um or do you exercise sort of freedom when you're able to sort of draw in air willfully mm -hmm. sort of self-aware or or sort of how, how does that kind of autonomic function of breathing mm -hmm. you're in in the work that you've been doing 
Yeah, I love that question so much. Thank you, Jeff. Um, also, I realize I owe you an email, but um, <laughs> um, I guess for me, I. I guess I'll answer two parts of the question, what I think are two parts to your question, right? So the first one being around freedom. Um, and the second one I think might be around um, an articulation of the different phenomenologies as you're seeing of breath um, as it takes up. So whether it's panting or gasping or choking, et cetera. Um, so to this latter one, um, to be honest, I, in the project itself too, I am not really um, convinced um, that a taxonomy of breathing um, is useful, right, for the project itself. I, um, as a sort of organizing principle, I think it makes sense to do so, right? Um, to articulate different phenomenologies, I think, for um, tying together themes and for thinking through um, how they are um, conceptually connected, right? But I think one of the difficulties with, one of the difficulties I have with taxonomizing, obviously, um, like so many scholars who have read any of the work of um, anybody does like global, you know, or imperial studies, et cetera, is that how taxonomy is like reveal far more about um, the, the sort of constraints and violences of the structures we're in than they might reveal perhaps around the ways that we get around them, if that makes sense. Um, and I think one of the things that I try to articulate in the project itself is that Precisely, even though as I'm mark, even as I'm mar marking these different phenomenologies, there's also slippages, right? So, sort of going back to Bob's question, um, in this sort of chapter, I, I think about shrieking and I think about panting or groaning and moaning um, as they're articulated on the plantation, but that transforms entirely into something else, right? Into gasping, right? Um, in my chapter on ecstatic breathing, and so there's a way that um, the different forms of breathing are obviously um, can be a, uh, tied to particular phenomena, but um, I'm hesitant to necessarily um, dis disarticulate them fully. Um, and that is precisely because I think the ways that breath live in our bodies can really um, uh, differ um, at various moments, right? Um, so I think there is a textural difference between parenting if you're jobbing just on a regular day and parenting if you're trying to run from the police. Right, and that textual difference matters, and that's what I'm trying to draw out. Mm -hmm. um, less than articulating, well, it's one kind of panting, one or the other. It's not what I think you're saying, but I think it was um, you're making me think about how I'm trying to articulate that in the project. But as it relates to the question of um, freedom, I think one of the things the chapter is, is working through is, is precisely about how um, freedom is kind of beside the point um, of a lot of the uh, work that's being done by black writers and black um, artists of the period of the 19th century, for example, right? Or even if we're thinking about how black folk are moving in the contemporary moment, right? And it's not that it's beside the point as in it's, in it's irrelevant. Um, it's beside the point, I think, because the question of freedom is so fraught and in fact, full of so many traps, right? It, it traps us into sort of maybe human rights frameworks. It might trap us into um, frameworks that are um, beholden to um, ideas of property ownership, right? Um, so being um, proper, being uh, owning property, um, having own ownership of oneself and others. Like, I think it ties us into certain kinds of structures that I think black study as a field is attempting to disarticulate. But I think one of the things that I um, am more interested in is in fact, both in the narratives, the slave narratives, as well as for example, Cartwright's work, um, the, the question is less about um, freedom, even though the, the language of free air is being constantly used and breathing free air, it's actually more along the lines of fugitivity, um, precisely because that is a far harder thing to articulate, right? Like freedom becomes a shorthand for actually the um, desires, the impulses, the philosophical, the enacted um, um, acts of fugitivity that are taken by enslaved folks um, or even by free folks, right, uh, in the everyday. And so that actual um, opaque uh, concept is what legal, you know, um, what's happening in the sort of legal sense, but also what's happening in the biological sense, right? With the race science, right? It's attempt to construct or confine or um, direct fugitivity towards an articulation or a taxonomy. And it actually escapes that oftentimes. So I think that the question of freedom is um, the language that's used because the language is available. But in fact, I think when you read between the, the lines of the text, oftentimes um, the question of the future is far more important, um, precisely because what is freedom um, except the end of the world, 
right? I mean, that's my own sort of opinion in many ways, like abolition and freedom is in fact just ending this world and not in a sort of gross uh, whatever, but it's in a sense of um, we have to end the sort of systems that we're in and that is a sort of intense project. And so what we can do in the meantime is be fugitive. Um, and I think that's actually the goalpost that I'm looking at rather, right? Um, because I think those sort of small fugitive moments, whether it's for Jacob's um, seven years of her imagining what it might be like to be in the North um, or in large moments where like we have folks who are, um, you know, escaping to other countries to escape, you know, uh, prosecution. I think those are the sort of moments that I'm more interested in. Um, I don't know if that actually got to the text of your question, but these are some of the things I was thinking about when you asked it. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Rob, and welcome back, Kim. It's it's great to see you. Um, I had a question that um, you're starting with. Eric Gardner uh, really sort of brought to the fore, and um, it just struck me that the temporal loops that you're exploring in this piece um, really help me at least um, begin to think more critically about the language of underlying condition because it struck me that by acknowledging that Garner struggled with asthma and then of course recognizing that part of the unaccountability related to his death had to do with the fact that um, the chokehold intersected with that asthma um, really is, is something that, um, in other words, underlying condition is not something that's universally applied or innocent. It was in this case used to absolve someone um, of the accountability that we saw applied in, in the um, Floyd case. And I wonder if you could help me think through some of the um, perhaps even environmental and certainly structural contributors to underlying conditions where Black people like Eric Gardner and indeed his daughter Erica Gardner um, indeed struggle from, uh, uh, with asthma long before he uh, confronted the officer. Um, so underlying conditions as a feature of black life that um, is structural, that's environmental, and that in some ways prefigure um, his gasping for breath in that tragic incident. Um, in other words, we can't just focus on the chokehold. We need to think critically about underlying conditions and intervene at that right. point too, is what your piece today really helped me at least begin to, yeah. to think about. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, I think you're exactly right, because one of the sort of things that the project is trying to, is working through is precisely how um, what we see and what we hear oftentimes are those sort of spectacular moments, but what lies under them oftentimes is an everyday mundane um, violence, right? That comes with being part of, or being marked as black, right? So I think one of the ways that um, I tend to this probably most explicitly is in my chapter around Louisiana's Cancer Alley um, with, and tear gassing, right? So in that chapter, as a brief overview, um, I basically walk through um, how we have to attend, not just the sort of uh, environment in a sort of large sense, um, but rather how we think about um, speculative environments that are being built in these sort of spaces, right? So the reason why I focus on Louisiana Cancer Alley and then why I focus on um, cities that have been tear gassed um, like for example, um, Minneapolis, example, uh, Philadelphia, et cetera. It's precisely because one of the things I'm trying to trace is how particulate matter actually creates these sort of speculative geographies of um, that mark, as you're seeing a uh, cannoli, um, how communities are wholesale um, uh, rendered debilitated or rendered um, um, susceptible to different kinds of violence or different kinds of trauma, right? So in Louisiana's Cancer Alley, it's just about a hundred mile stretch um, between um, New Orleans and Baton Rouge, where there's essentially over 
180 um, petrochemical refineries, toxic waste sites, um, uh, factories, et cetera, that are producing among some of the, the largest amounts of air pollution, as well as water, um, land, et cetera, soil um, pollution, et cetera, but air pollution in the United States, right? Um, the other two major sites actually are in Texas, um, not so far from where Sandra Bland um, gets pulled over and murdered. And I mentioned her in the talk uh, when I talked about getting pulled over for smoking a cigarette in your car. Um, and then the other one is actually, um, was in Philadelphia, right? Philadelphia had its own um, so-called cancer alley uh, where it had a um, oil refinery um, in Philadelphia's Greece Ferry neighborhood. Um, and so I think about um, a space like Louisiana's cancer alley where um, you'll see a lot of, I think, um, coverage of this in the news now, which is really fantastic. Um, you'll see that families that have lived there gen for generations, which are oftentimes black families, because um, huge swaths of Louisiana's Cancer Rally were historically black um, towns, right? So they were um, towns where um, fugitive enslaved persons and also free men would go and establish their small towns. These towns were then later on um, bought up by these factory and chemical refinery companies uh, to build their, their um, companies. So we have companies like, um, uh, what are some of the, the big ones? Standard Oil is like a big one. Um, um, at basically any of the S&P 500 top companies we can think of have some sort of like, you know, refinery there. And uh, for generations, the black families that have lived in Louisiana's Cancer Rally have uh, suffered with what, you know, Kanoe, you would say are underlying conditions, right? Um, or, what, you know, with COVID we all think of as underlying conditions. So um, lung cancer being a massive one of them. Um, we also have premature birth. Um, so a lot of uh, children that are born there are born premature um, and oftentimes they put on artificial ventilators. So there's a way that even um, breathing itself from birth becomes this sort of process of tuning to the machine, et cetera, that I trace through um, high blood pressure, um, um, intense amounts of um, poisoning. So like blood poisoning is really prominent and, and, and um, common there. Asthma, as you see, um, is another really uh, prevalent sort of condition that happens for uh, community members there. And so they've mounted and staged a sort of long, um, decades long protest against uh, the presence of many of these refineries that are there. But I mark out how actually the presence of these refineries and the particulate matter that it spews out into the air is creating a, a, a kind of um, overlapping geography that we have to think through, right? So one of the things I, I wish I could show you all, um, but it's a work in progress, but one of the things I've been working on, as I said, is a sort of speculative cartography of spaces like these. So. Um, I have a um, mapping of many of the major towns and cities along this corridor, and um, I map the sort of dispersion of uh, particulate matter in these areas along buildings and along like sort of homes, how they would hit essentially the different homes and what would stick and what wouldn't, um, what sort of disperses into the air to sort of trace out how, um, even when homes are, you know, bulldozed or when people move out. So oftentimes what will happen is um, in the area, companies will just buy out people's homes and then send them somewhere else essentially, although folks are fighting that. So I think through that and then, you know, a space like Philadelphia, which is another place that I talk through um, in one of my pieces of work where I, I think through the tear gassing that happens in Philly, for example, um, in last summer's protests, um, sort of speculative geographies that are produced in those spaces. So this is all a roundabout way of saying um, that yes, right, like this is a sort of small example of instances in which um, we see um, Black folk wholesale um, rendered disposable or rendered um, communities that can um, bear the burden of these sort of toxic um, accumulative um, waste matter. Um, but also it's not just in those, it's like in the everyday of that, that the sort of spectacular can happen, right? Because when we think about, for example, the protests of last summer um, and everyone's, you know, discussion of like, oh, comorbidities, comorbidities, et cetera, et cetera. Like we have to remember how like the reason why comorbidities is a thing is because of racism, obviously, all right? It's not just people somehow randomly have diabetes and become susceptible to COVID-19. Um, but one of the discourses that we sort of see happening is like the horror at which, the, the horror of the sort of general public when there was tear gassing happening in the middle of a pandemic, when everyone was like, well, aren't we already vulnerable um, to, you know, respiratory distress and you're now tear gassing folks. And it's like, well, we also have to think about the ways that Black folk have been historically already um, in distress around this. So um, that's a little bit of a, a thing, but thank you so much for that, yeah. Should I just jump in yeah. my, with my question? Yes. Sure. Hi. Thank you so much for this amazing talk. Um, and I was really excited that you just talked a little bit more to us about the work in, I guess it's the chapter on 
that's called Choked on Cancer Alley and your work on particulate yeah. matter and toxicity. I'm especially looking forward to following. Um, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about the terms. You've used the terms both speculative geography and speculative yeah. cartography. And I'm just yeah. curious to hear more about the choice of the word speculative and how you're sort of using that and defining that relative to whatever it stands apart from. Mm -hmm. Oh, fantastic question. Thank you, Emily. Um, and so for me, part of the sort of tune to the, to the language of the speculative is um, in relation to another chapter I'm writing around speculative finance, et cetera. Um, but I turn to that precisely because I have been struggling with, and I mean, if anyone has, you know, thoughts on this, I would appreciate it, but I've been struggling with um, the language to define or to articulate um, what happens when we have these invisible um, uh, infrastructures that we have to navigate, right? And these infrastructures are material, right? So it is false to imagine that, or I think it's false to imagine that um, having a petrochemical refinery in your, um, at the, at the, the um, what's the graveyard, at the graveyard of your ancestors is somehow like a thing that you can easily navigate. Like, I think there's a lot of different ways that it affects you, but I've been trying to think of a way to articulate what, do we, how do we attend uh, to these invisible phenomena, invisible to the eye maybe, or, um, without denying the way that they have a sort of material consequence, right? Um, and I think, you know, for me, the speculative um, can sit within that, or it's sitting in within that space right now, um, precisely because I'm trying to um, mark a kind of, um, I, I, I don't necessarily like the sort of phrasing of otherwise, but, um, but an otherwise mode of reading right, um, that we can do of space, right? And that reading is um, precisely maybe not the usual habits that we have for reading, right? Where we look to see things or um, uh, et cetera, but this sort of reading is one that is, um, or this sort of mapping perhaps that I'm, I'm sort of also produ producing for the interlude, right? Which is why I use cartography because I'm actually mapping in one sense um, a speculative geography, but um, our way of reading the space has to actually shift around different kinds of senses, but also different kinds of knowing, right? So like, what, it is, what is it to know that um, a petrochemical refinery, even if you can't trace where the particulate matter is going, what it is to know that that refinery's particulate matter is definitely like, you know, just covering in thick amounts a home that's nearby, right? Um, like you can't really necessarily, it's hard to swap for these things. It's hard to um, measure where it's coming from, where it, like, is it this particular refinery or is it this particular dump site, right? Like that's kind of hard to track. And so that's where it's speculative. It's speculative because um, I'm not really interested in fact so much as truth, right? And that um, difference I think speaks to um, a kind of um, black feminist poetical call within the, the field of black studies, which is like facts may not actually always represent what is true. And so it's speculative precisely because of that, right? And if the opposite of speculative might be um, a sort of quote unquote objective scientific uh, rendering of what these effects are. Uh, I hope that sort of answers your question, but thank you so much for that. It was wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, Anne. Yeah. yeah, thank you for um, absolutely brilliant. Um, it is, it is, it takes man's breath away. So I'm trying to, as people have felt, uh, trying to, um, Rob, could you mute? Because I've got an, a strange echo. Um, trying to catch my own breath, but I think what you've said mm -hmm. is so provocative and I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about invisible infrastructures that are then yeah. um, metamorphosed um, through different kinds of senses. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking of particularly, I feel in, in your work, this, a certain kind of alchemy um, where mm -hmm. you're really rethinking time and power together. And I don't quite know how to say, but I'm going to give an example and perhaps ask if, if because I found it inspiring and I'm very aware now of the words inspire. Um, the artist, <laughs> the musician, musician yeah. um, Guillermo Guillendo, mm -hmm. who, who's working mm -hmm. on the border and thinking of the, what you're saying about the invisibility of infrastructure. The wall is, of course, a very visible aspect, but most of most borders have been have been described. I can't remember who said it. Borders are fictions, but they are nonetheless fictions written in blood. And he's worked with Richard Misrax, the photographer, who, as he was traversing the border, the Mexican, the so-called Mexican-American border, 
would pick up objects by people who were trying to, um, again, these motions, these, these movements of fugitivity, trying to cross the border and would leave behind water bottles, um, pieces of clothing, um, shoes, sneakers, bags, and there were also bullets from the border the police. And what Guillermo oh. Gallendo did is he would then take these objects and create musical instruments out of them. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky enough to be in the room where he then plays, he turns it into oh, wow. these objects become a kind of composite breathing instrument. It's kind mm -hmm. of like a, mu a creative infrastructure and his own breath, he pants and gasps and moans into it. And mm -hmm. out of it, there's this extraordinary um, sort of new embodiment of the breath of the people trying to cross the border. And you can hear I'm struggling to put all of this into words. Yeah. So, but I was wondering, I think I'm really interested in, somebody mentioned um, temporal looping because the breath in yeah. itself is a loop. Every time we breathe, it's a kind of loop that takes us both past and forward. And whether you're thinking about, if, 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 if engaging with us is inviting you to think about time um, mm -hmm. otherwise. Yeah, um, I love that. And I love the um, the individual you just told me about. I would love if you could type the name into the chat so I can find it later on. Because um, I, I knew about the um, border crossing um, project of collecting the sort of um, uh, things that were left behind by folks who attempted to cross the border. Um, but I hadn't realized that an artist had done such wonderful work. But um, to the sort of uh, two things. Yes, the sort of question of the temporal is really important. Um, and I think that's part of what my interviews are attempting to do. Um, so my writing tends to be very recursive, um, which means that I constantly come back to the same sites, I return to them, I talk about them, um, oftentimes out of order, which is why, you know, for the talk that I offer, even though it's ostensibly situated within the 19th century, um, it is about thinking about the contemporary moment, right? And that's precisely because I think of history as um, not simply a thing that we study for the sake of studying, but in fact, um, speaking to our moment, right, always. It's speaking through us, the way that we move, how we can move, uh, where we can move, why we move, et cetera. Um, and I find that really important um, to also think about the ways that now speaks back to history, right? So um, there's this great line by Fred Moten uh, where basically um, the, the one sort of chunk that I remember from the line is he talks about proof um, being both proof and but not prophecy, right? Um, and I think of time or temporality in my work as that, right? So it's um, less interested in proof as a sort of factual thing, um, but rather as in a certain kind of truth, which can sometimes be a prophecy, right? Which is um, how Eric Garner can actually echo um, in Floyd, but also Floyd can speak back to it. So the question of time and temporality is really important. Um, and I think it comes out mostly in the way that I'm trying to structure the project um, with these interludes that dip back and forth. Um, this particular interlude that I shared with you around the um, uh, structure of the, the shipbuilding, right? So how ships are made um, to actually account for the, the need for living cargo to breathe. Um, that comes up near the end of the actual book. And that's partially kind of doing that work of returning us back to these sort of previous moments when in fact, at the end of the book at that point, I'm actually really firmly in the 21st century thinking about protests in the now, thinking about um, George Floyd, thinking about uh, Black Lives, movement for Black Lives, et cetera. And so um, I am attempting to sort of move us back and forth constantly around that, precisely because breathing is circular. Um, but at the same time, I also am trying to um, not just simply move us in sort of circles, but actually mark um, certain kinds of interruptions, right? So it's like, what, what I find really difficult to do is when I'm writing, when I'm thinking, um, when I'm creating, um, to remain ever only in one place or one time. Um, so I, I, I was telling a friend this recently, I was saying, you know, um, this was actually a couple of months back. This was on the anniversary of Breonna Taylor's um, murder. And I was speaking about how, you know, I was trying to write that day and I really couldn't get any writing done. Um, and I just, all I wanted to do was just rest that day. Like in that day in particular, it felt like I needed to, to sleep and I just needed to rest and something was keeping me from resting in many ways. And I was about to say somehow that, you know, um, this is a personal story so much as trying to say that how like the way that I can sometimes orient myself is realizing that how as I was trying to write this particular piece at the moment um, all around this like particular artwork um, of the contemporary moment I was actually thinking back to Brianna Taylor the entire time right and so what is it to what would it mean for my writing to actually attend to that right so what do it mean to actually interrupt the writing at times um, to mention something that seems totally uh, far-fetched or not 
perfect, but a scant to what I'm talking about, precisely because um, breath that I'm trying to mark is being interrupted constantly, right? You can't just breathe in a sort of circular fashion. You can't just have a regular sort of pattern to that breathing um, in the way that we think, whether we're reading it on the page or whether we're imagining what's being what's happening um, in the text, it's always be constantly being interrupted, right? So like even the act of writing for me is interrupted by these thoughts. Um, and so what would it mean that as I'm talking about Harriet Jacobs, I suddenly cut off to talk about something else. Um, and it's maybe it, maybe it might come across as I think too much perhaps playing with time. But I think the question of time is precisely important precisely because I think um, when I said the sort of at the start of this, the hardest part of being black is dying only once. I, I truly do mean that, right? Like it's also only living one life, right? Um, this way that collectively you're always bouncing between the experiences of others, um, not to replace those experiences with your own, um, but precisely because you have to attend to them. Um, there's just a, 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 a mandate that you do. Um, and that mandate in black studies, I think is attended to, and I, I try to change that. So that was a very round around, a round and around way of saying, um, yes, time is so, so important in what I'm doing. Uh, thank you so much for picking up on that um, in your question and your comment. We have time for one more question if if somebody would like to jump in yeah davy thank you so much for this talk which was um i'm not going to produce good words for it i just so appreciated it and appreciated the work that you're doing and the work that you're bringing us all into the room for uh, my question is a method question and it's about the relationship between reading and mapping uh, and specifically, I wanted to ask about, um, as you're working between language-based and visual modes of engaging space, um, what does language offer for engaging speculative ways of thinking about space? And how do you think about the spatial dimensions of language um, as uh, a kind of non-spatial method for engaging non-spatial spaces, for like what's good, what's useful about language in its speculative forms is also useful for thinking about space that exceeds space in the way that you're talking about some of your work around Cancer Alley. So yeah, thinking about reading and mapping is something to be exciting to hear you do. Uh, I love that question so much. Um, such a fantastic question, I guess. So I'm actually uh, conflicted about this, right? Um, I technically am a literary scholar. Do I think of myself as a literary scholar? It's an entirely different thing. Um, and I think I'm conflicted about that precisely because I recognize that uh, the non-lexical can actually provide so much texture to what I'm trying to articulate. And that's why I think at times in my interludes, for example, I turn to image, so I, I do a lot of collaging uh, for this project. Um, and um, part of the project is going to be digital in the sense that um, it's gonna rely on like sort of sonic production. So like uh, playlists or just like breathing noises, et cetera. But it's precisely because I think um, the question you bring up is ex ex exactly sort of the seat of the conflict that I find with um, language, right? I think language is precisely where the problem sits, right? For so many things, because language is how we narrativize our world around us. It's how we uh, make sense of the world. It's how we construct our logics, right? Um, and so I cannot but turn to language to articulate some of these difficulties and these logics. At the same time, I recognize that um, language what exceeds language oftentimes um, is oftentimes violence, right? Because language is meant to mask violence in many ways. Um, and it can also, language can also um, serve to mask the kinds of fugitive uh, uh, acts that we're taking, right? So what does it mean if you, you know, share a glance with someone, right? Um, there's a very different sort of sense between, I, I think about this a lot because I do a lot of looking at people, um, not maybe I do a lot of gaze conversations with folks, right? Like where I use my eyes to talk rather than using actual speech. And that oftentimes happens when you're in a loud room, et cetera. Or you can you can think about the difference between somebody being like looking to you from the side and being like, right? And what that means. And that says so much versus somebody looking like, or like somebody who's like, you know, like the sort of side eye um, being sort of, um, or that, that attention to the body and the ways that the body can communicate things is really important. And I think it's particularly important to thinking about the black tradition um, and how people are moving through spaces, right? Precisely because language cannot be trusted um, often. Um, and language can oftentimes reveal far too much. And so I've been trying to um, find spaces where the non lessal can come into the fore. And I think that's where breath can help me sit in that tension, precisely because breath can at times um, have a lexical referent, but oftentimes it does not, right? Like how do you actually write in language in a way that gets to the um, textures of it? 
a moan. Like you can write moan, you can write uh, but like that doesn't get to the kind of deep reverberations that you can sense in someone's like glottal throat, you know? Um, and I think that's where um, the interludes are really trying to attend to that, right? And something like mapping or alternate forms of reading. I use reading sort of capaciously, not just in terms of like reading text or reading with the eyes, but reading with the body in different ways. Um, precisely because I want to attend to that. In, in a sort of um, future iteration of this project, one of the things I imagined I would want to do is actually create a small little installation to attend to that precisely, that tension, right? So it would include things like scents and sounds and textures you can feel um, in sort of darkness, right? And thinking through that question. Um, but that's exactly, you hit the nail right on the head, like that's exactly the, the quandary that I'm grappling with constantly in the interludes and precisely why the interludes exist as they do, because I recognize that um, language for all that is structured so much around us and defines the logics of violence um, actually can't answer everything. So thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much, uh, Kim, for this incredibly uh, wide ranging, suggestive talk in its physicality, its methodological daring. Um, there's just so much that, that we take away from this. And thank you all um, to the audience for coming. And do join us again uh, for Philippe Milanis's talk uh, in on the seventeenth of November. Thanks again. Thank you all so very much for joining. Okay. Hope to see you all soon.